This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. OK, we're going to look at Chapter 19 of the free lecture notes for Paragraph 9, uh, which is on uh, the effect of changes in gearing. And uh, I mentioned in the um, uh, lectures on the previous chapter, when we calculated the weighted average cost of capital, that um, in paper F9, we do appraise projects at the weighted average cost of capital, but it does assume uh, the two things, that we're keeping the level of gearing the same, with different gearing, the weighted average would change, uh, and that we... Um, the level of risk of the new project is the same as the risk in the existing company. There's no change in the riskiness of the business itself. Well, this chapter, chapter 19, we're going to look at what are called the theories of gearing. Um, the effect changes of gearing has on the cost of capital. And there's no uh, calculations involved here for the exam, but you are tested quite regularly on these as you'll see, three theories of gearing. Uh, and the first theory, as soon as uh, people started thinking seriously about financial management, they appreciated uh, that something I've already said, that as far as um, uh, debt is concerned, more debt finance is attractive because uh, it's cheaper, there's tax relief, uh, and it's less risky for the investor. But at the same time, more gearing made things more risky for shareholders. And if it's, the shareholders find it more risky, they want a higher return. Uh, the cost of equity, therefore, would increase. Uh, and so the traditional theory said, OK. Now, these are the figures in example one. And they're only to illustrate. You wouldn't be actually asked to do this in the exam. But they said, OK. Um, as we increase the gearing of the company, when it's 100% um, equity, um, we've got a cost of equity 20%, but with more and more gearing, 20% debt, 40% debt, and so on, um, the cost of equity goes up. And I've just invented figures, but higher gearing, more risk to shareholders, higher cost of equity. As far as the cost of debt's concerned, You'd expect the cost of debt to stay fairly constant. Um, it's risk-free. Uh, but at very high levels of debt, then OK, the debt does have an element of risk. You know, they may not be able to pay the interest and the company may collapse. And so perhaps debt lenders want more. And again, I've invented those figures. But just to illustrate, more gearing, higher cost of equity because there's more risk. And on those illustrative figures, what would happen to the weighted average cost of capital? Well, of course, if they're all equity financed, there is just the cost of equity, the cost of capital would be 20%. If it's 80%, 20%, the weighted average will be, oops, 80% of 22%, together with 20% uh, debt, at a cost of 10%. So the weighted average would be what? 17.62. Uh, it would be 19.6%. I don't want to waste too much time here. As I say, you won't be asked to do this in the exam, but I'm just trying to illustrate to you what the traditional theory was saying. Uh, what happens if we go 60%? 40%? Well, 60% equity at a cost of 25%, 40% debt at a cost of 10%. 60% of 25 is 15, 4. Ah, the cost of uh, the weighted average cost uh, would fall to 19%. Uh, similarly, 40%, 60%. 40% of 30 is 12. 60% of 12 is 7.2, 19.2%. Uh, and finally, 20% of 35 is 7, 80% of 16, 12.8, the total 19.8%. Um, so again, 
I've invented those figures, but just to illustrate the idea that as the level of gearing changes, obviously the weighting changes when we're calculating weighted average. With higher gearing, uh, the cost of equity, there's more risk, so the cost of equity will increase. And as a result, the weighted average tends to change. And if it is going to change, surely there must be a minimum. And any business wants to borrow at the lowest cost of borrowing. They're showing it graphically. Again, it's only an illustrative graph. I'm not trying to prove anything. But if we look at the cost of capital as against the level of gearing. Here's where there's no gearing, where it's all equity, as we move up with more and more gearing, more debt. Well, the cost of equity, you know, in my example, when there was no gearing, it was 20%. But the cost of equity, as we increase the gearing, the cost of equity will increase. Traditionally, we draw a straight line, but there's no need for it to be linear. It doesn't matter. It's completely irrelevant what's coming. All that matters is the cost of equity stands to go up with higher gearing. Uh, the cost of debt, well, in my example, was 10%, except at very high levels of gearing. And the weighted average, well, again, when we're all equity finance, it's simply the cost of equity. But as you bring in more debt, the, the cheap debt pulls the weighted average down. But at the same time, the higher cost of equity is pushing it up. Well, again, the weighted average stands to change. Now, again, I'm not proving anything. This is purely illustrative. I don't care whether the cost of equity goes up in a straight line or it doesn't. All that matters is it stands to increase. Uh, the weighted average. If you think about it, it, it stands to be a curve, but I don't care. I don't care if it goes up, down, up, down. The point is the weighted average stands to change. And therefore, it must somewhere have a minimum. And any business wants to borrow in the cheapest possible way. And so maybe they start off all equity. Ah, introduce some debt, introduce some gearing, the weighted average falls. But of course, once we get to the minimum, introduce more debt and the weighted average starts to go up. And so the minimum is what the company wants to achieve. This would be the optimum level of gearing. Any company, according to the additional theory, should get to that level of gearing at which the overall cost, the weighted average, is a minimum. And what are the implications of that? Well, as I say, they should aim for that level of gearing. Um, the problem is that how do we know what the optimum level of gearing is? You know, this was just the traditional thinking of it. There is, must be an optimum level of gearing. The company should aim for it. But, you know, for our company, what is the optimum? And all we can do is appreciate there is a minimum, but do it by sort of trial and error. We start off all equity. Oh, next time we need money, let's raise debt. See what happens to the weighted average. Ah, it falls, great. Need more money, raise more debt. Fine, what happens to the weighted average, it falls. But when we come to the stage <clears throat> when raising more debt starts to increase the weighted average, then of course, it's costing more. We should raise more equity and sort of by trial and error, you get back to this optimum gearing. And once we've got to that optimum gearing, you know, in my little illustration, the best was here, 60%, 40%.
then surely once we've got to the optimum level of gearing, the cheapest weighted average, any future finance should be raised in such a way as to keep to that level of gearing. Because if we kept to 60-40, the weighting obviously stays the same. With the same gearing, the cost of equity, cost of debt will stay the same. And so once we've got to the optimum level, future finance should be raised in that way. There's no point in raising more debt, the overall cost will go up. There's no point in raising more equity, the overall cost will go up. We should get to that optimum level, then raise finance in that way, so as to keep the gearing the same. All right, well, that's fine. That was additional theory. But as I said a minute ago, it would be rather nice to know what the best level of gearing was, you know, and aim straight to it rather than this trial and error business. And so, in the 1960s, 50s, 60s, two gentlemen, Mr. Medigliani and Mr. Miller, they started to investigate, and they made, although they made various assumptions, which I'll come to later, they said, OK, the cost of equity will go up because there's more risk. But since we know what's causing the risk, think back to that earlier chapter where I showed, you know, more debt means more fixed interest, more risk for shareholders. Since we know what's causing the risk, perhaps we should be able to calculate exactly how shareholders will react and exactly how the cost of equity will change. And they found This is Medigliani and Miller, ignoring tax for the moment. They found that with higher gearing, yes, the, way, uh, the cost of equity would increase, but it went, it increased in a very precise way. Because more debt means more fixed interest. They came up with a proof that the cost of equity would increase, but again, it would increase very precisely that it wouldn't just be 20% going up. As I say, it would go up in a very precise way. Uh, cost of equity, uh, debt, rather, will stay fixed, except at very high levels, the cost of debt will, in fact, start to increase because they start having risk. But what they then found was very interesting, that the weighted average cost of capital well, again, if we're all equity, there's just cost of equity, weighted average would be 20%. <coughs> uh, if it became 80% equity, 20% debt. Well, 80% of 22.5 is 18. 20% of uh, 10 is 2. The weighted average ah, was still 20%. If it's 50-50, 50% equity, 50% of 30 is 15, 50% debt of 10 is 5. Again, a weighted average of 20. Uh, and 40-60, uh, well, 40% equity at 35% is 14. 60% debt at 6% is 6. The weighted average, again, 20%. Now, again, this is only illustrative. You won't be asked to do this, but it's just to prove to you that it can happen. Again, they said, OK, cost of equity will increase with more gearing, but it goes up in a very precise way. They came up with a formula for it, but that's not in your syllabus. But when they came to look at the effect on the weighted average, they found that the weighted average cost of capital would stay constant. But all right, on the one hand, debt, cheap debt is pulling down the weighted average, but on the other hand, more expensive equity is pushing up the weighted average. That the two effects, if you like, cancel each other out. But the weighted average, they found, would stay constant. Uh, again, if I illustrate with a simple graph, 
it's there on the next page, you won't be asked to draw this graph. But you certainly could be asked to explain the theories, and if you find it easier to do a graph rather than write about it, no problem. But, I'm oh, sorry, it's not going to be very nice. Just to illustrate what they found, again, the cost as against gearing. When there's no gearing, we've just got the cost of equity, which again, in my example, was 20%. And again, with more gearing, the cost of equity will increase. But again, it, it will increase in a very precise way. Traditional theory was it will go up. It might go like that. It might go like that. Anything. But according to Medigliani and Miller, it goes up in a very precise way. Cost of debt. They accept at very high levels. In my example, it was, what was it, 10%, I think? Mm -hmm. But when they put the two together, with a weighted average, they found the weighted average stayed constant. That it didn't matter what the gearing was, any level of gearing, the weighted average stayed the same. And of course, what's the implication of that? If the weighted average is going to stay the same, whatever happens, there's no such thing as an optimal level. It's irrelevant how a business raises finance. Doesn't matter whether they borrow equity, whether they borrow debt, the cost will stay the same. The gearing is completely irrelevant. And that caused, a, 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 well, not a revolution, but I mean, it, it did have a massive impact on financial management. Uh, and um, I've already said the, the formula you came up with aren't in your syllabus, and proving that isn't in your syllabus. Although it was quite amusing, they came up with one proof, which they published in a, um, uh, an economics journal. Uh, and in the next issue uh, of this journal, um, two people, a Mr. Hallintz and a Mr. Sprenkel, they said what Medigliani and Miller had done was very interesting, but that their proof was wrong, and they came up with a different proof. And in the next issue, Medigliani and Miller thanked Heinz and Sprenkel for their article, but they said Heinz and Sprenkel's proof was wrong, and they came up with a third proof. So in a sense, it was proved three different ways. But anyway, that's irrelevant what matters. Uh, is that according to Medigliani and Miller, the weighted average stays constant regardless of the level of gearing, and it's therefore irrelevant how a company raises finance. However, the one big problem there, they did make loads of assumptions, which I'll mention later, but the obvious practical problem is that it ignored tax. And of course, in real life, there is company tax. And what's the effect of company tax? Remember, the cost of equity isn't affected uh, because dividends aren't tax allowable. If shareholders want 20%, the company has to pay them 20%. However, the cost of debt, remember, is reduced because whatever interest they're paying the business gets tax relief, makes the net cost of debt that much lower. And so you can almost guess yourself what's going to happen. Uh, but just to finish off with the same sort of illustration, they introduced uh, company tax into their proof. And they found, if you look at the Final little illustration on page 97, with different levels of gearing. Well, I'll use the same figures we had before. That the cost of equity 
sorry, cost of equity. As I said a minute ago, the cost of equity isn't affected by tax. Dividends don't get tax relief. And therefore, what was it? It was 20%, 22 and a half. Uh, 30%, 35. But the cost of debt in my previous example, when there was no tax, the cost of debt was 10%. But um, with, uh, t if we've got tax at, let's say, 30%, um, the cost of debt after tax falls to 70% of 10%, 7%. And of course, what happens? The weighted average cost of capital, 100% equity, the weighted average is 20%. Uh, start to introduce gearing. This time, 80% of 22.5% is 18. 20% of 7% is 1.4, 19.4%. When it's 50-50, 50% of 30 is 15, 50% of 7 is 3.5. The weighted average, 18.5. Uh, and finally, when it's 40 60, 40% 40 of 35 is 14, 60% of 7 is 4.2, 18.2%. Now, as I keep saying, this is only illustrative, but surely bring in tax. If the only thing that's going to change is the cost of debt gets cheaper, it's hardly surprising that as we introduce more and more gearing, the weighted average falls. And so, for the last time, if I illustrate with a graph, cost gearing. Again, as far as equity is concerned, in my example, when there was no gearing, uh, cost of equity was 20%. With more gearing, cost of equity goes up. But in a very precise way, higher gearing, higher cost of equity. The cost of debt, well, remember, without tax, it was 10%. Debt suddenly got cheaper. Because of tax, debt is now only 7% except at very high levels. And again, it should be fairly obvious to you if you're happy with the previous graph, uh, that if without tax, the cheap debt exactly cancelled out by the higher cost of equity, make debt cheaper still, and the weighted average will fall, except at very high level levels of gearing, it starts to increase. But at any normal level of gearing, the weighted average will fall with higher gearing. And so what's the implication of that? The implication, surely, any company wants to borrow in the cheapest possible way. Uh, the company should introduce, or, or should raise as much debt as possible the higher gearing, the better. Higher gearing, the better. But for one reason and one reason only, the only thing that makes debt finance uh, preferable to any other way, to equity finance, is because of the tax relief or the tax benefit on debt interest. <laughs>
if that tax benefit wasn't available, if the state changed the rules or something, then it wouldn't matter how you raised finance. As things stand, the more gearing the better, but purely because of the tax benefit associated with debt. So there we are. Uh, they did make lots of assumptions. Now, I've said several times, you cannot be asked calculations on this. My little examples were just to illustrate. Um, you can only be asked written questions on this. It's at P4 where um, you'll see the formula they came up with, but not an F9. So be clear on the three theories, traditional theory, Medigliani Miller without tax, Medigliani Miller with tax. However, although uh, the formulae and the proof isn't in your syllabus, they did make uh, quite a few assumptions in uh, arriving at their conclusions. And the main assumptions are listed uh, in paragraph uh, five. Uh, just run down and check your clear um, what we mean by that. Um, shareholders have perfect knowledge. Uh, what I mean, remember, the market value of uh, shares depends on their expectations of future dividends and the rate of return they require. Uh, well, perfect knowledge means they have complete knowledge of what the business is doing and what, therefore, the expected dividends are. It assumes they act rationally with regard to risk. You know, I said earlier, uh, from one of the earlier chapters, we know what we mean by the risk due to gearing. It's that fixed interest. But they do assume that a shareholders act rationally, that, you know, if there's more risk, they will want a higher return and so on. Uh, they assume a perfect market. A uh, perfect market ignores things like transaction costs. You know, when you're buying and selling shares, there are costs involved. That's ignored in a perfect market. Perfect market also assumes that um, the share price is always reflecting expected dividends required return. That, you know, if a company, um, if we suddenly start to expect higher dividends, it assumes the share price immediately changes. Whereas in practice, it might take a while. Uh, it obviously assumes debt interest is tax allowable and that the company is making profits and therefore can get the benefit of that tax relief. Uh, jumping one, it does assume irredeemable debt, whereas in practice debt is um, more likely to be redeemable. The one I jumped over is a bit hard to explain without showing you the proof. And again, the proof isn't in the syllabus. Uh, but the way they prove it is they say, ah, oh, why is the risk if you uh, buy shares in a geared company? It's because the company's paying that fixed interest. In the proof, they compare it with having shares in a company with no gear. And how can you compare when there's no gearing? Well, they say to make it comparable, let's have the investor borrow money so they're paying interest. And they say, ah, if the investor's paying fixed interest, it's exactly the same as if the company was paying fixed interest. We can compare the two. And so that's what I mean. Corporate gearing is when the company is borrowing money and paying fixed interest. Personal gearing is when the individual is borrowing money and paying fixed interest, and they assume that the two are the same, but they're not. If you borrow money, you know, you're personally liable. If the company borrows money, the shareholder isn't personally liable. So, I mean, that's getting a bit far, but the uh, other assumptions uh, should be uh, pretty clear and be able to, you know, they expected to list the whole lot but do be able to mention two or three of those assumptions. Uh, finally, nothing to do with Medigliani and Miller. Medigliani and Miller say that with tax, we should raise as much debt finance as possible. Uh, from a practical point of view, um, 
It's more like the, what we call pecking order theory. And all pecking order theory says is that in practice, companies should raise money in whatever's the easiest way at the time. And what's the easiest way of raising finance? By far the easiest is retained earnings. I mentioned that several chapters back. Uh, that finance is immediately available. Now, the second easiest way is simply to take loans to raise debt finance, straight debt, as opposed to later convertible debt. We've dealt with all of these. The next easiest is to um, issue preference shares, paying fixed dividends, similar to fixed interest. And then finally, uh, the most sort of expensive way of raising money, equity shares. Which does tie into a certain extent with uh, the Deglanian Miller. They say we should raise as much debt as possible. Pecking order theory says retained earnings first, that's easy. But then it should be debt finance. We'll get the tax relief. Then it should be preference shares. We won't get tax relief, but it is fixed interest. Uh, and then, if uh, we still can't get enough money, then we turn to raising equity finance. So, there we are, uh, quite a lot of chat, but I'm, I'm afraid it is just a chat chapter. The last time, you cannot be asked calculations in the exam, but Medigliani and Miller is such an important theory, you're extremely likely to be asked something about it. Traditional, M&M &M without tax, M&M &M with tax.